Space consideration of an ethical issue in pediatrics, um, and it's sponsored today by the Truman Cat Center for or hosted by the Truman Cat Center for Pediatric Bioethics. Um, as some of you know, the usual format for our ethics grand rounds is as follows: the session will begin with a case scenario that's inspired by an actual case that will be presented by a children's clinician. The case is generally modified, and it's intended as a starting place to consider the ethical issue that is raised. Um, the session is not intended at all as a retrospective review of the case, um, and it's followed by a commentary for 15 to 20 minutes by an invited guest. And the session concludes with a moderated discussion based on the commentary. Our goal is to stimulate discussion and we anticipate that people will have different views on the issues raised and as always we expect the audience will be respectful of the commentator and of the other questioners. Um, before we get started, I want to acknowledge that today's Grand Rounds is supported by a fund provided by Jeff Sconiers and Deborah Godfrey. And I also want to remind everyone that the Truman Cat Center um, for Bioethics Summer Conference um, will be this summer on July 22nd to 23rd, and you can register online. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that our next Grand Rounds will take place on October 6th, and Al Johnson, our next Bioethics Grand Rounds, and Al Johnson, the former head of UW Bioethics and Humanities Department, will be the speaker. So now I'd like to introduce our case presenter and commentator for today. Um, the case today will be presented by Dr. Brian King. Um, Dr. King is the Director of Psychiatry and Behavioral Medicine at Children's, as well as Professor and Vice Chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UW. He's also the Program Director of the Seattle Children's Autism Center. Um, and after he gives the case presentation, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions of clarification. And our commentator today, our invited guest, is Dr. David Wendler. Dr. Wendler is the head of the unit on vulnerable populations in the Department of Bioethics at the NIH Clinical Center. He coordinates the Clinical Center's Advanced Directives Program and is a member of the Bioethics Consult Service and the IRB of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. His current research focuses on the ethics of clinical research with individuals who are unable to provide informed consent. He has written widely on such topics as ascent in pediatric research, assessing research risks systematically, research with stored biological samples, and protecting communities in biomedical research from exploitation. Dr. Wendler has been a <coughs> consultant on minimal risk for the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, on research with wards of the state for the Division of AIDS at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, and pediatric research for the Institute of Medicine. So without further ado, I'll just um, turn it over to Dr. Dr. King. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to uh, start out by thanking Ben and Holly for the invitation to come and be part of the Grand Rounds, and thank uh, Jeff Conyers for his support of this, uh, this series. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be with you all this morning. I've been given very strict marching orders in terms of the time that I have to uh, present the case, so um, we'll encourage us all to fasten our seatbelts, and as we're doing that, uh, we'll take this opportunity to uh, mention uh, potential conflicts of interest for me. Um, I've received research support from uh, the National Institutes of Health, from HRSA, from Seaside Therapeutics, and from Roche. Uh, so the issue that I want to help uh, frame for us this morning relates to um, autism clinical trials. And one of the problems that we face in the field uh, is represented here uh, in this slide, which shows the placebo response rate in autism uh, trials uh, over the last decade or so. And what you see uh, is that uh, the placebo response rate is not insignificant, that uh, in a number of different studies, the response rate uh, can be upwards of 30, even 40 percent, and that makes it very difficult to discriminate uh, a signal from the background. And one of the problems that uh, may contribute to this uh, is the tools that we use. Uh, so that, uh, as represented here, the Aberrant Behavior Checklist Irritability Subscale is sort of the coin of the realm when it comes to recent clinical trials. And one of the, um, one of the problems with, uh, with this scale in particular that I would just uh, highlight is that not all of the items uh, are necessarily created equal from a clinical uh, meaningfulness standpoint. So if I just highlight some here, I think many of us will agree that uh, self-injurious behavior, as represented by those items in red or aggression, may have more of a clinical impact, a more significant clinical impact than yelling at inappropriate times or crying over minor annoyances, and yet they're each given the same point value in this scale. So in, 
when it comes to uh, our view of the coin of the realm, uh, you know, these tools may lend themselves to uh, counterfeiting those coins in a way. And so um, we need to think about how our tools are used and what they mean. And we'll represent another problem with the use of the tools here. Um, and it's, uh, it's a little dark, but I'll tell you that uh, what we're doing here is looking out the window at a visitor uh, you see in the center. And the question here is that uh, people confronted, presented with the very same uh, stimulus may come away with very different interpretations of what's going on. So some people may look out the window and, and say, gee, how lucky are you that you're visited by wildlife, that, you have, uh, that you're, you know, you're communing with nature there and that the deer are coming and sharing the space with you. And other people may look at the very same image and say, whoa, uh, too bad for you, your roses are in jeopardy and here's a vector for Lyme disease right next to your house and um, I wonder if you can shoot them from your window. And so, so the very same image can have a very different, uh, perhaps uh, lead to very different uh, interpretations. And yet some other people may say, wow, look at those cobwebs, don't you ever uh, clean your house? So, <laughs> So we have embarked on a study to try to get a better understanding of uh, the tools that we use and the factors that may influence how those rating scales are completed. And this is a study to explore factors that may influence parent ratings of treatment outcomes. And the questions that we wanted to explore with this study were, if we videotape children uh, in their environment, their real world environment, and collect uh, samples, examples of behavior that's uh, particularly good and behavior that's particularly more difficult and uh, sandwich that around uh, behavior that's pretty typical for that child, can we use those as a way of understanding how outcome measures are completed by parents and factors uh, that may influence how those ratings are rendered? So the study design was to uh, film these children over several hours. Uh, the family would bring the videotapes back to us. We would edit the tapes to very brief vignettes, about two minutes in length. And then we would randomly splice these uh, vignettes uh, either with what we consider to be very good behavior first uh, and more challenging behavior at the end or the other way around. The vignettes themselves are the same, it's just the order in which they're being presented that varies. And we presented these to families in a preliminary study and uh, asked whether it makes a difference. And part of the reason here is that in these clinical trials that we do, often it's the very last visit that determines whether an individual is a responder or not. And we worried that if you had a bad experience that day, if the parking lot was full or if the elevator wasn't working or, um, you know, if the, uh, the cereal was, uh, was soggy, that you could come in there, you know, and could parents discriminate a bad day from the trial as a, as a whole? And interestingly, our preliminary data suggested that in fact it does matter or there may be something that we need to pay attention to in terms of uh, whether um, children are seen uh, doing well initially or, or not so well. And this point spread, again, these are the very same vignettes just presented in different orders. The point spread in this subscale is comparable to the degree of improvement that may make the difference in a clinical trial. Six points is not insignificant. So in the course of replicating and expanding this study, um, we encountered a young child who forms the basis of our uh, case presentation today. And uh, we'll, we'll call him Brian, uh, which is a high risk name. <laughs> and uh, say that uh, Brian is an eight-year-old boy who was diagnosed with high-functioning autism at four. The family was concerned about uh, his catastrophic reactions to minor change in his environment, difficulties around transition and aggression directed toward the family, and these behaviors had prompted a number of medication trials. Um, his social communication deficits interfered with his ability to make appropriate peer friendships and preferred to spend most of his time making elaborate Lego uh, creations in his room. And more recently, he became preoccupied with medicine and would spend hours performing life-saving surgeries on his stuffed animals. Over time, the severity of, of his behavioral difficulties prompted uh, several medication trials, as I mentioned earlier. 
At the time of enrolling in the study, he was cooperative, uh, actually eager to come in and meet with the investigative team. Uh, in the process, he saw a box of disposable exam gloves in the clinic and became immediately quite preoccupied with whether he could score a pair of those gloves before he left um, that he could take home to assist him with his surgeries. His parents were also eager to participate in the study. Um, Following the return of their video, uh, we were watching in the course of editing it and came across a scene uh, that uh, involved Brian uh, having one of these catastrophic responses to the call to leave his room and come down for dinner, and it was prompting all kinds of uh, uh, distress. And as Brian and his father are talking, uh, Brian reaches out to strike the camera and says, stop filming. And his dad says, it's important that I keep filming. It's important to do research so that others can learn about autism. So um, as we think about where this, uh, this statement may be of particular interest uh, uh, for the thinking today, I want to, uh, to share a couple other uh, family photos here with you. Uh, and one is uh, my children uh, standing in front of a big moose. And uh, while we're driving in Upper New England, saw the moose off the road, pulled over, said, okay, everybody out of the car, we've got to get a picture. And you can't see it, but uh, if you could, uh, you could look at my daughter's face there in the, in the corner and say, gee, I wonder what she's thinking. Um, does my dad know there's a giant moose behind us? Um, <laughs> or, uh, or many other thoughts that she could very well have uh, in, the con in the context of... Uh, getting out there and standing in front of this moose. And, and we can do this as we look at uh, another person's face and their emotion. We can put ourselves in that person's shoes and think through what uh, their life experience uh, may be, what may be going on uh, in their thinking at the time. But this is not something that uh, is necessarily true or easy in the context of autism. Um, and the question is, what, what, the question for today, what does it mean uh, when Father says it's important to do this so that other people can learn something, when your concept of other people and what they know or think may be um, distant at best? Uh, indeed, for the last 20 plus years, people have thought that one of the core deficits in autism is an abnormality or absence in theory of mind, which is this ability to take the perspective of another person, to see the world from another person's shoes. And in recent studies, this has been replicated uh, widely and now extended, uh, not only to autism, but in schizophrenia, there's evidence to suggest that people may have impaired uh, theory of mind abilities uh, similar to those that have been described in autism. And in the last decade, the neurological basis of these theory of mind deficits has also been suggested uh, as perhaps relating to mirror neuron dysfunction. So uh, Iacoboni and Depreto uh, down at UCLA have done a lot of studies looking at measures of theory of mind um, and uh, have shown uh, that there seems to be a correlation, at least, between reduced uh, mirror neuron dysfunction and measures of theory of mind and that this extends also to measures of autism symptom severity. So in this uh, final graph that I'll share with you, uh, the investigators looked at autism symptom burden as measured by autism diagnostic interview and observation scale scores, where the higher the scores bring you out over here, and uh, uh, mirror neuron system activity here, and you can see uh, what appears to be a very uh, tight correlation between reduced mirror neuron function and uh, autism symptoms and by extension, the thinking that there may be theory of mind deficits. So um, as we uh, find another animal in front of, uh, that we can put our <laughs> kids in front of, this one with horns, the, 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 uh, the horns of the dilemma today are, are uh, summarized in the following questions. And that is, uh, is it ethically acceptable first to enroll children in research that does not offer any direct uh, clinical benefit? And if such research is acceptable, why? 
But then another extension of that is uh, if the justification for the research is for the greater good, uh, is it acceptable for individuals who have impaired theory of mind, who don't appreciate the benefit of others necessarily, um, how do we adjust our risk-benefit ratio if we need to, to uh, account for that? Um, is it necessary, in fact, to appreciate all the potential benefits of research participation in order to provide assent or consent? And then lastly, um, what should uh, the investigators do after seeing a video uh, of a subject asking for the video to be turned off? Should it be destroyed or what have you? So with that, I'm going to um, turn the mic over to David, who's going to sort this all out. <laughs> Good morning. I just want to thank Ben and the Truman Katz Center for inviting me here today. I think it's an extraordinarily healthy sign of an institution that takes care of little kids and does research on children that you've got a flourishing bioethics program and that's integrated into the institution as evidenced by people being here this morning. I think you should get particularly worried when people start thinking you shouldn't be doing bioethics any longer, <laughs> thinking about these issues. So I think it's great that everybody's here and I think it's especially impressive that Brian's willing to bring his research here and invite a philosopher ethicist to come and comment on it. So we also do ethics grand rounds at the clinical center. So this I think of as the sister, we have sister projects here. And I know that the success of that project depends very much on having clinicians like Brian who have the willingness and the courage and also care about these issues to present them in front of everybody. So this I think is a fantastic issue, and I think I probably could spend about two years of your lives trying to explain to you what I think are the important issues, what I think is my view, and then trying to defend it. I'm going to try to do a compression of those two years into 20 minutes. It's going to go by pretty fast, but hopefully we'll have some time at the end where maybe I can clear up some of the things that I didn't make very clear the first time through. So this presentation, the entire presentation, will come with a huge black box warning. I'm a philosopher, and I typically, I've worked at the clinical center for 15 years, and I've learned over the years to talk to doctors and researchers, and for the most part, I've learned that you try to keep the philosophy to a minimum. That's not going to be possible in this case, I'm going to argue. I think that if we really want to focus on whether and when research is ethical, particularly with people who can't give informed consent, we have to think really hard about fundamental issues, philosophical issues, issues about what makes our lives go well and what makes our lives go less well. So that's what I'm going to focus on. So as I mentioned, we do ethics grand rounds at the clinical center, and they happen in the Lipset Auditorium for anybody who's ever been to the clinical center. And the Lipset Auditorium is named for a guy, Mortimer Lipset. He was the director of the clinical center through the 70s for about 15 years. And at the end of his career, somebody asked him to sum up his view on clinical research and how clinical research had changed over the course of his career. And he said, I think in a beautiful, very pithy way, he said, the difference is that when I started doing clinical research, we did clinical research to subjects. And now we do clinical research with subjects. And in one sense, I spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics of clinical research. And one of the things I'm trying to do is to figure out what it means to really understand that transition and what it really means to understand doing research with people rather than two people. I think that's hard enough when you think about competent adults. I think it's a really hard question to answer when we start thinking about individuals who can't consent and who can't even understand. So I spent a lot of time thinking about the ethics of research with infants, or in this case, people who have severe Alzheimer's disease. So that's what we're going to try to do in the, next, in the next 15 minutes. I'm supposed to tell you, nobody pays me to do this stuff. You'll understand that by the end of this talk. That'll make perfect sense to you. So no worries, at least that I'm biased. I may be crazy, but I'm not biased. OK, so I'm going to try. A lot of times what philosophers do is they try to give you some profound argument, something you've never thought about before, and try to convince you that that thing is true. I'm actually going to do something very different. I'm going to try to get to convince you and point out something that I think everybody in this room believes, but I think we don't think about very much. In fact, we may have never thought about it in our entire lives. But I think it's going to be important to think about this aspect of our lives in order to understand this case, in order to understand this ethical issue. 
So I think this starts by the way I want to think about it very broadly, is thinking about what makes our lives and the lives of children go better and the lives of children go worse. And I think typically we go through our lives, we just know the answers to that question. Pain is bad. Good coffee is good. For me, good wine is good. And we don't appeal to any theory. How do we know those things? How do we figure those things out? Well, I think basically what we're doing, implicitly or explicitly, is we have some idea or some understanding of what makes our lives go better and what makes our lives go worse. And we also have an account of that for our children, the way we cheat our children, whether we decide for them to get piano lessons or go to school or let them stand behind moose. <coughs> Brian may have a different theory of what life goes well for children than the rest of us do. <laughs> That's not going to be part of this conversation. Um, but what I'm going to do is think about a very specific aspect of that understanding of the way our lives go well and the way our lives don't go well that I'm going to try to claim we all believe. We haven't thought about it, so it's going to seem odd in a certain way. And it's just something we're going to have to all let marinate maybe over two weeks or something. And then you can email me and tell you if it makes any sense. One thing, important assumption, this is a really rich case. There's a lot of things going on here. I can't do the central things justice. I won't be able to do all of them justice at all. So one of the things I'm just going to assume, I'm not an expert at all on autism. I'm just going to assume that our account of what makes our lives go better and worse applies not just to an average one-year-old, it also applies to an autistic child as well. Um, I think that's true. I think that's basically the reason why we do the research. If we didn't think they had the same basic account of what makes their lives go well, we wouldn't be trying to address their autism, I think. But that's something we can talk about and maybe have Brian talk about. But largely, I'm going to assume that for the purposes of this talk. So here's the background. First, I want to start with something that's completely independent of children, completely independent of pediatric research, to try to focus on this aspect of our lives that I was just referring to. So here's the example. I come here today. I walk through a door. I open the door. It's a door with no glass, no pain in. I haven't been here before. I'm acting normally. I'm doing what we should do. I open the door. There's a child I don't know is on the other side. Hits the child knocks the child down, child's severely injured. Somebody calls a code, code team comes, child ends up in the ICU. First question is, what do we think about that event for the child? So obviously that's a bad thing for the child, right? It's a bad thing to be knocked down, it's a bad thing to have the pain, it's a bad thing to have to spend your time in an ICU, away from your friends, not going to school. That I think is easy. The hard question that I want us to focus on is, what do we think about that event for me? What do we say about what that event says about me and my life? That's the question I basically want us to focus on. So first of all, I think it clearly depends upon the details of the case. And here's a general claim. The more, in a sense, that I'm connected to that outcome, the child being hurt, the worse it is for me. So what does that mean, connection to that outcome? Well, there's a lot of different ways I could be connected to it. It could be that I knew the child was there. I intended to hurt them. I planned to hurt them. Maybe I was thinking about this for months, planning this whole thing. The more we develop the story along those lines, the more I have that kind of connection to the child being hurt, I think the more we would say that's bad for the kind of person I am, for the kind of life that I have. Right? So if I plan this, then I'm a bad person. I've done something really bad with my life. Now I want you to imagine, take all those factors away. Try to strip them away. What we want to try to do is we want to try to think about the kind of interactions that two-year-olds have with the world or severely autistic kids have with the world. They don't plan things in this way. They don't intend things in this way. They don't foresee things in the same way. How do we get an example like that? So what I want you to imagine is I'm just acting normally. I don't see the child. I didn't think about the child. I'm just trying to get to the grand rounds. I'm not even rushing. Didn't know the child was there. If I had known the child was there, I never would have opened the door. I think this is a terrible outcome. What do we think now about my relationship between what I'm doing and this child being hurt? So you try to fill this out in a way that none of these other factors are relevant. All that we've got in the end is we've got my causal connection to the child's being hurt. What do we say then about what that outcome says about me? Well, I think a couple of things are clear. There are certain ways in which it's not bad for me at all. I didn't intend it. I didn't foresee it. Let's imagine I couldn't have known it. So I'm not bad. I'm not immoral. I shouldn't be blamed for what happened. I think all of those things are very important. And I think if you talk to a lot of philosophers, they'll say 
those are the important things, since I'm not bad, I'm not immoral, I'm not to blame, then I shouldn't worry about it at all. I think that's roughly right, but I think it misses a crucial aspect of our relationship to others and to the world, which is basically this. Even though I'm not to blame, even though it doesn't suggest I'm a bad person, I didn't plan it, I didn't try it, it's still the fact that I did it. I'm the one who opened the door, I'm the one who knocked the child down, and in fact, I'm the one who put that child in the ICU. I didn't want to do it, I didn't try to do it, but I'm the one who did it. And here's a way, I think, to think about that. I ask myself, or ask yourself if you're in that situation, imagine that we run that tape of your life or my life backwards to the point where I'm just reaching for the knob. And just before I get to the knob, my hand's two inches, as I told you, we're going to be doing philosophy here, so I hope everybody's ready now. Two inches before the knob, I'm just about to reach for it. Just before I reach for it, a big gust of wind comes from outside. I have nothing to do with the gust of wind. It opens the door, and that leads to the child being knocked down. Same outcome. Outcome for the world is essentially exactly the same. Outcome for the child is exactly the same. But I want to suggest that from my point of view, for the way my life goes, I would rather that have happened. Right? I would rather that the gust of wind opened the door than that I opened the door with my hand. But outcome's exactly the same. Why are those different if we think there's different? So I'm claiming that they're different. Why might that be the case? Well, I think it's simply this. I'm the one who did it. If I'm the one who opened the door and knocked the child down, I'm the one who did it. And so what this suggests to me is that what do we have left here if we take away, I didn't plan it, I didn't try it, I didn't intend it. What we have left is my causal interactions with the world, with other people, with that child, and without outcome. Basically, I'm the one who causally did it. And so here's the claim, is when you causally do things in the world, those causal impacts you have on the world become part of what I'm going to call, very loosely, your life's narrative. It's part of what makes up your entire life. So by the end of your life, part of it's going to involve the causal impacts you had on other people. So for me, one of the things that will be in my life's narrative is, at that point, at that time, I knocked the child down by opening the door. And my claim is, so this is the central claim of the entire talk right here, is that that's bad for me. By knocking that child down, by hurting that child, I did it. That becomes part of my life's narrative. And it's bad for me, for my narrative of my life, for the impact I have on others to cause harm in this kind of way. OK, so that's the background. So basically, the idea of that example, why did I pick that example? Again, it's just to try to focus on the implications of the causal impact we have on others for our own lives. And the reason why I want to scale down a case like that is because sometimes that's basically all the impact that, say, a two-year-old can have on the world, or that somebody who has autistic can have on the world. So the question is to figure out what implications those impacts have for those individuals. OK, so that's the background. So now we've got to apply it to pediatric research. So the primary question I'm going to focus on, Brian raised two primary questions, whether or not what I call non-beneficial pediatric research research that doesn't offer a prospect of clinical benefit to the subjects, whether and when that research can be acceptable when you have individuals who can't consent and who don't understand the research. Somebody who has severe Alzheimer's disease, somebody who's two years old. Well, for people who know the history of research ethics, this debate has been going on since the early 70s, at least in the US. It's one of the most prominent debates in research ethics. And a lot of really smart people really concerned people have come up with the answer that it's never acceptable, that this is just unethical stuff to be doing, and we should stop doing it. So Paul Ramsey, who was a theologian at Princeton for a long time, thought about pediatric research ethics probably more than anybody has in the entire history of the world, basically argued that <clears throat> this research is unethical if the child can't understand, can't give their own consent, and therefore parents should not be making decisions to put their children in this sort of research. Henry Beecher, for people who know the history of research ethics, is one of the most famous people in the history of research ethics for a different paper he wrote in the late 60s in the New England Journal of Medicine. He was a famous anesthesiologist at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. He said he was worried about the fact that children can't consent. And he said that shouldn't be doing this research until they're 14. The idea is at 14, they'll be able to consent for themselves. 
Um, there are two cases I know of, legal cases in the US, that explicitly look at this issue. Both of them basically say roughly the same thing. I won't go through it. We can talk about it if people are interested. The primary one is Grimes versus Kennedy Krieger Institute in Hopkins, at uh, Baltimore that's affiliated with Johns Hopkins, where they basically said, this research is unethical, people shouldn't be doing it, and in Maryland it's illegal. Actually, that ruling still stands in the state of Maryland, interestingly enough. Um, there's also some survey data that people have done that suggests a lot of researchers, a lot of pediatricians, a lot of medical students are worried about this kind of research too. So this is some data from pediatricians and researchers. About half of them think that children should be in research only when it will help them. Canadian medical students who seem at least half of them to think the same thing. So there's a lot of people who I think rightly are really worried about this research. And I think that presents a huge challenge for us. If we think this research is important, it needs to be done, we need to think hard, I think, about trying to figure out why it's justified given these worries by concerned and really smart people. Now, there have been a lot of attempts to try to justify pediatric research over the years. And unfortunately, I'm definitely not going to be able to go through these today. So these are what I take to be some of the most prominent ones. And I think basically, although a lot of them are important or interesting, I think each one of them has at least one or two fundamental problems. Those are the things to the right of the colon is the problems. You're not going to be able to read all of this, obviously. Instead, I'm just going to do an ad hominem. I'm going to appeal to two of the experts in the field, one of whom, Norm Faust, is a good friend of Ben's and has worked with Ben a lot. And basically, he says, after thinking about all these issues, Norm Faust is a pediatrician. He's done pediatric research. He's been the chair of an IRB for over 15 years. Despite all that, he says, a convincing justification for pediatric research without the potential for clinical benefit has never been made. He does it. He thinks it's important research to do. But he thinks going through all those justifications, they don't work. I don't think they work in the end either. I think that's why we have this challenge now. So I just want to point out one of them briefly. This is basically what people call the educational benefit argument, which is the very important point people make is that why are we worried about research that doesn't offer a chance for clinical benefit? Because I think the implicit assumption then is if there's no clinical benefit, then there's no way in which the child can benefit at all. And if they can't benefit at all, then we're just exposing them to risks of harm without any chance of benefit. That's the worry. What this argument points out, I think, in a very important fundamental insight, is that there are other ways, non-clinical ways, in which it's possible for children to participate by, being in, by benefit by being in, in uh, non-beneficial pediatric research. So the example this argument gives is an educational benefit. You can learn things by being in research. You can learn the importance of helping others. You can learn about science. You can learn about medicine. Those lessons can be really important to a lot of children. I think they are. The obvious problem is that that argument doesn't apply to one-year-olds, probably doesn't apply to Brian, in this case, who has severe autism. Maybe he can't ever learn those sorts of lessons. But important point, there are other ways to benefit. So the question I want to ask, are there other ways besides educational benefits that children can get from participating in this kind of research? If there are, what kind of risks can those potential benefits justify? So really quick example, then we're going to apply it to clinical research. So the prior example of opening the door was one of an adult, knew what they were doing, and hurting somebody. That's not pediatric research. Pediatric research is children trying to do things that are helping other people. So how do we get an example like this? Here's one quick example. You can read the history of this. It's absolutely fascinating. About early 1963, Martin Luther King and his lieutenants are very worried. They're trying to get big mass movement for civil rights going on in the US. There's belief that the movement is sputtering. It's not going anywhere. One of the suggestions from one of his top lieutenants is, why don't we enlist kids? Why don't we get kids into this movement? Get kids marching. Get kids helping us with this. Interestingly enough, there's an enormous fight over this, which in a way I think mirrors the fight over pediatric research. Malcolm X says, that's unethical. Putting kids who don't understand on what he called the firing line for us is something you shouldn't do. He put it in terms of real men shouldn't do this. There's a debate about it. Martin, Malcolm X lost this debate, at least. May 2nd and 3rd of 1963, hundreds of kids walked through the streets of Birmingham, Alabama. The Birmingham police and the Birmingham fire department go after the kids. They spray them with hoses. They knock them down. They arrest them. Media's there, takes lots of pictures. 
Those pictures get promulgated around the world. And these are quotes from uh, the Martin Luther King Library at Stanford. Historians claim, I was, certainly wasn't there, those images trigger worldwide outrage and an enormously important impact on the success of the Civil Rights Movement. So here you have a case where little kids who basically didn't know what they were doing, who were facing risks for the benefit of others, had an important impact on helping others. The reason why I like this example for today's case is notice that it's very similar in a certain way to what Brian is doing in the autism research, right? How did these guys have a benefit? People taking pictures of them, people seeing those pictures, and those pictures having effect. It's very similar to what's going on, obviously in a different context, with the research example for today. So what this suggests to me is what? So what this suggests is that advancing civil rights is not just good for the US. It's not just good for everybody. The claim I want to make is that it's good for the kids who made those contributions. Now, I think you might deny this. The historical record is that a lot of parents said, my kid's not doing that. That's not an appropriate thing for kids to do. That's a decision we should let parents make. If parents don't want their kids to be doing civil rights marches, that should be up to the parents. If parents don't want to enroll their kids in clinical research, that's another decision that parents should make. That's one possibility. This is something kids shouldn't do. But I think there's another very plausible argument. So this is the view that I want to recommend, is that even the kids who didn't understand, right? so this is the important point for today, even those little kids who didn't really understand civil rights, they didn't really understand discrimination, they still made an important causal contribution to the furthering of civil rights. And my claim is just this. Ask yourself the question, for your life or for your kid's life, would you rather have them have the same life they have that has no impact on helping others or civil rights, or that same life and having been part of the children's crusade that furthered civil rights? For me, the answer is really clear. I think it's better for that child to have had that as part of their life. So that's the central claim that I want all of us to think about. It's better for that individual. So this suggests a simple test for figuring out what we should think about what I'm calling non-beneficial pediatric research. Imagine the child's life with and without the thing in question. So in this case, we're talking about pediatric research. But this is a way to figure out whether or not something furthers or sets back a child's interest. Is the life with X for the child better or worse than the same life without that thing? So it's obvious it works for things like pain, right? So you have the child's life. It would be better for that same life without this bit of pain, without being knocked on the head by the door, without being put into the ICU, right? So those things are bad for the child. On the other hand, getting an education we think is good for a child. Their life is better for having that as part of their lives. So just apply this to research. General claim is you can, if you're deciding or a parent is deciding whether to put their child in a research study, they have a choice. Basically, they can say, Let's assume, optimistically, the child's going to have a good, a decent life. Deciding to put in the research study is that same life plus contributing to some research study. And the question is, how do we compare these two options? Not for the researchers, not for the children's hospital, but for the ch child or the children themselves. And what I want to suggest is that there's at least one, some reason to think that the second life is better for the child. Just like it's better to have been part of those children's crusades, if it is an important study, if you're really contributing to that study, if the risks of the study are very low, then it makes sense to say this is a good thing for this child to do. And here's the, I think this is a controversial claim, but I think this follows from it, is that that benefit to the child doesn't depend upon the child understanding. So I, at least in the children's crusade case, I don't want to say, did that benefit those child? Was that good for them? Well, it depends on whether they understood racism, et cetera, et cetera. If they were 15 and they understood, it was good for them. If they were seven and they didn't, it wasn't. I think that they're all making a contribution. So it all counts towards their credit and benefits them, at least to a certain extent, even when they don't understand. Now, how much you do, how much of a benefit is this? I really think it's a benefit. I think it's a really small benefit, all things considered over the course of a life. So what that suggests to me, it can justify some risks to be in this kind of research study. But it can only justify very small risks, very low risks, or very minimal risks. All right, so lastly, I just want to quickly talk about BASIP. This we'll have to talk about more if people want in the question and answer. So the other question was, what about the fact that Brian says, stop the filming. I, want, I don't want you to do this. So there's a general requirement for getting what's called assent, agreement of children. 
and respecting their dissent if they say no. So here's my general view. We should get assent. Assent is a way of respecting people who can understand what's being asked of them and who can make their own decision. So in my view, getting assent makes sense at the point at which a child's able to understand. So if they can understand, you should get their assent. If they're not able to understand, it doesn't make sense to get their assent. I take it that Brian wasn't understanding this research. Therefore, I think that assent doesn't apply to him. So the fact that he said, take the camera away, isn't implying that he's not assenting. However, there's also dissent. Dissent is still important. And it's even important for children who don't understand. Why? Because dissent, saying I don't want this, can be an important indicator of the child experiencing anxiety, stress, being upset. And those factors may suggest that it's the risks become more than the very small risks that I think are acceptable in this context. So you have to still take that distress seriously as an indicator of whether or not the child is feeling anxious and distressed, even if they don't understand what the research is about. So just very quick summary, this is, these are Brian's questions. And here's what I've tried to suggest in an obviously overly quick way. Is pediatric research without potential benefit ethical? I think it is, provided the research is valuable and the risks are really low. Why? Even if you don't understand. Because I think contributing to valuable projects, ex ante, we could talk about that if people are interested, promotes children's interests and justifies at least very low risks. And is it justified for people who don't understand, for instance, very young, or have an impaired theory of mind? My answer is yes. It doesn't depend upon their understanding for this to be a benefit for them. But importantly, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it does under depend on this account of interest applying to children with autism. And I think that's probably a really deep debate that we could have. And lastly, in terms of the dissent and assent, is it necessary to appreciate that research is, is uh, ben intended to benefit others? I think it is. That's what I call the federal regulations call an essential element of informed consent and assent. If you don't understand that, you're not giving, uh, you're not giving assent. Assent shouldn't apply to that person. So what should the investigators do? Brian says, stop the filming, take it away. Should they destroy the film? And I think the answer is yes, if one of two things is true. Either Brian does understand, and he's withdrawing his assent. I understand what you're doing, and I don't want it. If that's true, we should respect him and destroy the tape. I take it's not true in this case, that he didn't understand. The second possibility is that that stop the film may be a signal that the filming is causing him distress. And if it is, and that, and that distress is more than very minimal, then we should stop the research, and I think also destroy the film. So in either of those cases, I think we should stop. We should destroy the film. If those things aren't true, he doesn't understand, so it's not a lack of assent, and the research isn't causing him real distress and anxiety, then I think the research is fine, and there's no reason to destroy the tape. OK, thank you. to questions, if you can come up to the microphones to ask your questions and identify yourself, that would be great. Thanks. Interesting talk. <laughs> um, I have another side benefit, uh, which you didn't allude to, but that Brian actually brought up in his presentation. Um, there's a tremendous placebo effect in being involved in clinical research. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of benefit to this child participating in the research because of the family's greater engagement, all of the extra attention the child's getting, et cetera. So I don't think we should dismiss, dismiss the fact that just yeah. participating in research um, is also beneficial. Good. No, that's really important. And, and to the, there's obviously all sorts of more clinical ways that people can benefit being in research. They're, maybe they're getting an important drug. Maybe they're getting good treatment. There's lots of benefits. And to the extent that there are those clinical benefits, then I think that just makes the argument easier. Then if there are those benefits, and those benefits outweigh the risks, then it's clearly justified. So what I just wanted to take on today was what I take to be a harder case when there aren't those types of benefits or they're not sufficient to justify the risks. But I still want to say that that kind of research is justified as well, although for a different reason, a different kind of benefit. I was director of what is now called the Center on Human Development and Disabilities. And I'm bringing up the question of labeling autism, particularly autism, high-functioning autism, Asperger's. 
I think the, in this presentation, the parents told the boy he had autism. Well, I can't believe, as an epidemiologist, I can't believe that 1% of American kids have autism. And now the, the recent uh, South Korean study showing that, what, one in 38 kids have some aspect of autism. I don't, when I was in the business, there was a question of labeling, labeling people with mental retardation who were functioning very well in society, and until you took an IQ test, you wouldn't know yeah. that they uh -huh. had a low IQ. And now we see cases of very successful professors who are labeled autism, Asperger's. Yeah. And I read articles about people who have written four books and uh -huh. speak several languages and so forth, but they have okay. Asperger's. I think there is a damage in labeling kids who as are autistic who are functioning. We have not yeah. yet defined what it is. Okay, great. And you remember that it was un not until 1973 when homosexuality ceased to be psychopathology. Okay. And now is a normal Good. variant. Yeah. Well, I, I made a deal with Brian at the very beginning that I was going to answer the easy questions at this session and he was going to answer the hard ones. <laughs> uh, Brian, do you want to say something about that one? Um, this doesn't seem to be working. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I actually just wanted to say that I appreciate the comment. Um, and it clearly takes us in a different direction in terms of the topic today, but is something that um, is uh, an important area for the field to address. Uh, not only what the boundaries are around the diagnosis of autism and where we set those boundaries, uh, but also the impact of uh, finding psychopathology where it doesn't exist and um, not uh, being so eager to pathologize all of human life. So, so I think that, that might be a wonderful ethical discussion for a future topic. The, if, we if we take a step back from the diagnosis though and, and look at some of the theory of mind deficits um, that uh, some people present with, I think that still then brings in, in fact, it goes beyond the boundaries of autism. It does, again, um, make relevant this question about the depth of understanding of a potential research subject and, and how we assess that. While I've got the mic, I uh, would just uh, say that um, the way that uh, David's framing the participation in research and the benefits uh, sounds very similar to me to um, taking children to soup kitchens and having them distribute food to people that they don't know or right. having them come to the children's hospital and pull weeds and you know that there's yeah, there's risk in those activities but it does seem like we're, we're putting research in or at least some of these uh, yeah. activities in a different good for the public good for society uh, right. position. Good. Maybe I'll just say one brief thing about it. that's a wonderful comment and one of the things I've been doing uh, over the last five years is exactly trying to draw this comparison between charitable activities for children and research activities for children. I think Brian's exactly right. I think it's a valuable thing to try to think about really hard. Um, and you have cases, both contexts in which you're having children do something to help others. They're facing risks. And it seems like in the charitable activities of children, most people seem to be perfectly fine with it. There's more worries about pediatric research. I think it's interesting to try to think hard about that comparison and whether or not we think there's a difference there. I can just tell you that bioethicists think there's a huge difference, but we've done some surveying where we've talked to both children who are in research and parents of children who are in research and who are not in research, and we asked them, what do they think about the difference between their child helping others in a charitable activity or helping others in pediatric research? And it's interesting, there are both children and parents who have distinct preferences, but if you look at overall, on average, there's no difference, right? Some of them think they prefer doing a charitable activity. Some of them would prefer doing it in research, but they think both are worthwhile activities, recognizing the risks as long as they're sufficiently low 
and there's a chance to really help other people. So it's a great thing, I think, for people to think about. Yes? Hi, I'm Blythe Thompson, one of the oncologists and on the IRB. And um, I wonder if you could comment on, you talked a lot about um, the potential benefit, but how should an IRB member or a researcher assess risk? So is it compared to a general population, to yeah. a child with the same disease, to daily life? Because right. that's what we struggle with so a lot about, you know, getting a picture taken doesn't seem so bad. Right. Getting your blood drawn, well, that doesn't seem so hot. Mm -hmm. So if you could just comment, what is a low risk? Right. So ba basically, people, this is Seattle Children's, a lot of people probably know. So, so the, the federal regulations have an explicit definition of what low risk. They call it minimal risk. And roughly what that definition specifies is that a project, a study like this, would be minimal risk if the risks to the child in the study are no greater than the risks that children face in daily life or during routine examinations and tests. That's basically the definition. I think for the most part, that's a reasonable definition. I think making this comparison to some other context is a great way to evaluate risks. We have a lot of psychological data that all of us are just terrible at evaluating absolute risk. So if you just give people, what, what would you say if there's a, a 1 in 1,700 chance of doing X and you'll lose your legs. People have no, we have no idea how to evaluate risks like that. Having this comparison gives us an anchor, I think, that makes it an easier job to do. So in that sense, I think the federal definition is great. I think there's a problem with it. I think it's too broad. Could talk about it more if you're interested. I'd be happy to email you some things. Roughly, it comes back almost to Brian's point. I think what we need to do is we need to realize and think hard. This is the point I started with, that in doing this research, these kids are really helping us and contributing to the research. And so we need to think about it more in that context. And so I have what I call the charitable participation standard. And basically what we should be doing is we should be asking, what risks do we think it's acceptable for children to face in the context of activities that are designed to help other people? And we should figure out what the risks are of those activities. And the risks of those activities should give us a threshold for the kind of risks we should allow in pediatric research, roughly. And I think that's, it's, it's similar to the uh, existing definition, but it's a little bit narrower. But I can tell you, talk more about it if you're interested later. It's a great question. So, so Dave, that was, that was terrific. Um, and what I thought was interesting about your description about the impact on the child was it was not about was it good for a moment, but was it good for his life, which right. is a pretty long yep. view of the world. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. But the question I want to ask is something about more transient. Because we, you talked about risk of harm. You also talked about the issue of dissent. But there's another aspect that I'm just curious to hear your thoughts about, which is really a, is the idea of distress, uh -huh. which is maybe transient. Right. But whether it's in the ch child's crusade or whether it's in, that re in, the, in Brian the film, right. he was experiencing distress. Yeah. Oh, blood draw can cause that. So how do we right. deal with that distress issue, which is not dissent, which is not risk of harm necessarily, but it's just momentary, yeah. but maybe real unhappiness. Yeah. So I think there, if you, if you, there's, a tradition, there's, there's a sort of bifurcated tradition in the literature. Some people look at distress and burns as different than risks of harm, and some people see them as the same thing. I'm in the basically see them as the same thing camp. Basically, for me, I think whether it's distress, whether it's anxiety, whether it's losing your kidneys, whether it's having trouble hearing for five days because you're an MRI, basically, I think the question is you have to ask, how bad is that thing for the kid? And we can ask that, I think, about being anxious for a second. We can ask that about being anxious for a day. We can ask that about losing your legs, having to have dialysis three times a week. So I think of it as just another kind of harm, or a potential harm if you're not sure if it's going to happen. And then what we have to ask is we have to ask then if it's happening. So if Brian is experiencing anxiety, you bring him into the clinic, say, and he's already having some anxiety. You have to ask, how bad is the anxiety for this kid? Now, I, I realize in autistic kids, that's a really hard question to answer. But the theoretical thing is, I think you just have to figure out how bad it is. And what we do is we say, my argument is that this kind of contribution can justify very low level harms to the child. So as long as everything that they're experiencing that's bad is 
very low level, then I think it's OK. And the point at which it gets over that, now of course this is still a fairly vague concept, but we could try to operationalize it in different ways. But to the point at which it gets over that is the point at which we say stop. This is now more than a minimum risk study for this kid. We take them out of it. I'm just curious about what's the, what's the uh, actual risk for a child getting into a car with all of the uh, usual uh, accepted yeah. public safety standards? Yeah, well, we, it's, it's interesting. We did, some, we did some work a couple of years ago. So this, this standard for minimal risk compared to the risk of daily life has been in existence for about 25, 30 years. But no one had ever looked to find out what are really the risks in daily life. So what the heck are IRBs doing? Right? Basically, what we found out they're doing is they're sitting around. Everybody on the board, scrat and this is I haven't been on IRB for about eight years. We do this too. Everybody scratches their head for about 10 seconds, says, hmm, fMRI in 11-year-old, minimal risk, or something like that. And they're just making it up. And I think that's really bad. <laughs> Because we know from psychological data that when we do that, we're just terrible judges of risk. We judge things like if it's familiar. So if it's going into a car, we're like, ah, that's not a big deal. If it's something we're not familiar with, like bungee jumping, then we think that's really risky, even though the objective risks may be similar. I don't know what the risks of bungee jumping are, but you could imagine. So I think what we need is we need to get data on what the risks really are and we need to come up with methods for comparing them as a way of trying to at least minimize these psychological biases that we have. So we've done some of that to collect some of the data on the risk kids face in daily life. And basically, the conclusion we came up with some of the highway safety data is that the risk is probably something like one in a couple hundred thousand of death from an average car ride. So what that suggests to me is that even a risk of death is consistent with a study being minimal risk provided that risk is really, really, really low. And what those numbers do, I think what's valuable, what those numbers do is they start giving us some objective sense of what counts as really low. So for death, it's something like less than one in 100,000. Then what we did is we looked at some sporting activities and looked at things like s real pain, a painful sprain, something like that. And that'll give you some objective standards for harms that are bad, but less bad than death. And I think we just need to do more of this to get really systematic about it to make sure we're doing this right. I think we're going to have to stop because we're out of time. Thanks very much to our speakers. Oh, thanks. It's, Questions. It's, it's interesting. So we're doing some research actually. We're